Welcome to A Care Collab. Thank you so much for being here. And oh my goodness, what a beautiful orchid we have once again in the viewfinder. This Care Collab is about the care that I apply to Epicatlia Rene Marquez. And seeing as we have several participants where we might also see some blooms, and if you've come to my video after having watched their videos and you're looking at my blooms, you're probably thinking, hmm, that's different. I wonder if the bloom changes because of the climate that it is grown in. And if that is something that you've possibly thought about, you have a very, very good eye. Let me show you another one, just to give you another option. How about these blooms? Epicatlia rena marquez? Not quite, but close, right? So, what's going on here? Well, this is a care collab for the Rene Marquez. I happen to have three orchids with Rene Marquez as a direct parent because my Rene Marquez as such failed in my climate. I cannot tell you what I did wrong, but to ensure that I have this beautiful color combination and the star-shaped blooms, I bought myself hybrids. To the right, you're seeing Sergio Ara Yokosuka story, and to the left, you're seeing Bonara TLDC fan Thursday. Bonara TLDC Fan Thursday is a hybrid between Rene Marquez and Rincolalia Digbiana. And now let's back out even a little bit further. And to the left, the big, big one is Epicatlia Rene Marquez crossed with Dimarandra Emarginata, which is an unregistered cross and it is enormous. So this gives you an idea of how strong the Rene Marquez gene is in a hybrid where it is a direct parent. My tallest one here, crossed with Dimarandra emarginata, is approximately 80 centimeters tall from the bottom of the pot to the tip of the tallest cane. And then the Volnara TLDC Fan Thursday reaches approximately 60 centimeters this being the end of that orchid. <laughs> and Volnara Yokosuka story, as you can see, is about 40 centimeters, so take your pick. The reason I brought them all out together, obviously, is because of the subject of the matter today, Epicatlia Rene Marquez. And I believe that the care for these is exactly the same as an Epicatlia Rene Marquez. So let me tell you what I do with mine. We need to get in a little bit closer again for that. Now, if you're wondering about the name Vonara TLDC Fan Thursday, what I could find on the internet has me a little bit confused, but I'm gonna roll with this one and I'm gonna tell you about it because it is rather unusual. I wanted to know what TLDC stands for. T is for Taiwan, L is for luxury, D for dream, C for culture. Taiwan luxury dream culture. So that, when I looked into that further, it took me to a chain of hotels, the LDC Hotels and Resort Group, which owns a collection of hotels and wedding venues, restaurants and bars in Taiwan, having recently expanded into Italy. I don't know if that is of interest to anyone, but when I have crosses, I like to go and check and see if there's any registered names. This one came up and I'm always stumped when there are abbreviations that are not being elaborated on. So whether I'm on the mark with Taiwan luxury dream culture as an LDC being that this orchid is named after a group that runs a collection of hotels and resorts. I don't know, but I just thought it was an interesting little nugget for all the nerds like me out there. Now, seeing as I'm in southern Spain and I have absolutely no humidity to be proud of or that I can speak of, and these reed stem epidendrum kinds of orchids are super, super thirsty. I mean, we saw it with the candidate that's still on the table on the left. It is almost a meter tall. I have all of them in LECA and self-watering. The reason the third pot isn't in the viewfinder is because I don't want to be bumping off my blooms, but they're all in a row based on how they can be displayed without one breaking something off the other. This setup has been absolutely ideal for me, especially throughout the summer months. They are very thirsty orchids when they are in active growth. I would have to be watering every day if I had them in a classic setup of organic media. My ambient air and the hot dry winds dry everything out really, really quickly and I wouldn't be able to keep up. So LECA and self-watering has worked a dream. In 2020, I did a massive radical root prune and all the roots were viable in the pot and still I took it upon myself to remove one 
third of the entire root ball because they were so vigorous in the pot that they were starting to squeeze each other out and there was no room for oxygen exchange. That didn't disturb them one bit. It didn't set them back, it didn't slow them down, and I had blooms again in 2021. The setup is working for me perfectly. And the same with the fertilizing. They get 300 parts per million when they are in active growth. Right now, as we're coming out of winter, I have to fertilize 160 parts per million because the growths that are blooming now and the big one on the left that is in spike, they develop through the winter, which is a little bit awkward to say the least because of how big they get. Being that they prefer warm temperatures and very high light. I have these indoors during the winter all the time. They don't move in or out and especially not when they're developing their buds because bud blast is very, very quickly a thing with these guys. So they have to be fertilized throughout the winter, but I cannot go full Monty with 300 parts per million just because my temperatures go a little bit lower than they would prefer. So let's move straight into the temperature subject when they are indoors with me throughout the winter their little space there on the glass shelf by the window can get down to 15 degrees celsius because they're right up against the glass which gets very cold during the nights but i need them in that location a because of the air space that they occupy i also need them there because that's where they will still get direct sun because they want a lot of light and I also need them in this location during the winter months because they are developing the new growths and I'm doing light training. I cannot have these large gangly orchids growing all over the place. I need them to be as upright in the pot as possible to accommodate them. So I cannot move them away from that location and 15 degrees Celsius is what they can get some nights during my winters. During the summer, however, I have them on the lower shelf in my south facing covered portico where they are getting a lot of bright shade throughout all the summer months while they can stay outside. And that is where their temperatures can go up to 40 degrees Celsius. And that is when they start drinking like crazy. The two that are currently in bloom, there is no sign of active growth at the base. And for that reason, right now, all they're getting is just some fresh water, which is not a bad thing considering that their pots will be nice and clean, free of any mineral deposits when it comes to me being able to put in the full 300. The blooms really are something to behold if you are into all the colors so fresh and bright spring summery they're absolutely beautiful i love star-shaped blooms anyway and i love the combination of how these came out and the fact that the Rene Marquez is so strong in these hybrids because that is exactly what i actually wanted you know the colors with the pink column and the lip now on the viewfinder, my lips look a little bit more yellow, which is great because, you know, René Marquez has a more yellowy lip. But in actual fact, my lip is a little bit more to the warm color of yellow, a little bit more towards the orange side. Needless to say, I am not bothered at all. And there's something to say about this lip as well as this lip. They're all the same. They are so tough. They have a really waxy kind of structure to them. It's almost like they're fake. And you can see how the Rincolalia digbiana has given a much more frilly kind of edged serrated lip structure as opposed to the Rotada Free Spirit parent here for the Rene Marquez. It's a little bit more rounded a more cleaner finish at the end of the lip. And the blooms themselves are not as star-shaped and they're not fragrant. When it comes to pests, oh my goodness. I here have to be very, very vigilant about mealybugs, even as the spikes start to form, even while the growth is still growing. They seem to love the foliage as it grows and they tuck themselves into all the little nooks and crannies. And given where they are located during the winter while they are growing, I really have to never forget to look at them every single day just to be on the safe side. Now I use my garlic alcohol very, very successfully on these guys. So during these winter months, I've had less problems. In 2021, I did have some blooms, but they were quite pathetic, sad, and they didn't last very long. The bloom duration on these is at least three to four weeks, if not more. 
So yeah, mealybugs, muy, muy importante to keep an eye out that they do not manifest themselves, that they do not get a hold. But thankfully, that is all there is to it when it comes to pests. I've had no other issues with these orchids. Mealybugs are easy to get rid of. They might be a little bit of a pain in the derriere to always insist on trying to come back, but the garlic alcohol is working a treat. And these blooms you see here have been open now about a week. I have a much better blooming this year because of the garlic alcohol. My Yokosuka story here had to grow two growths this winter. And as it is a second lead, I only get one bud, but that's fine. The orchid is getting stronger, larger, and two growths is more than I had in 2021. So I'm enjoying this one very, very much. Also because it's a little bit more compact and a little bit more manageable. Now, if we want to consider quirks, then I have to tell you about the quirks of these René Marquez, even as a hybrid. Let's go up a few floors and have a closer look up there. Here we are in the lofty heights of the René Marquez cross with the Imarginata. And you can see that beautiful spike forming. It will take probably another eight weeks before we see any blooms. These blooms are a little bit different. They will still have the star shape. They will also reflect the color of the Rene Marquez, but the petals and sepals through the course of aging start to blush into a purple. Just gorgeous, a little color changer that starts out just like the TLDC, but then it starts to get a little purplish blush. Anyway, sorry, I digress. The quirk of all these reed stems is the fact that they can rebloom on older nodes. So if a spike is still green, I would not cut it off until it has gone absolutely and completely brown, brittle and dark. It is possible as the orchid grows and matures and gains more strength that the older spikes can branch and eventually maybe another bloom can come out. So even though they look woody and a little bit tatty, let's look at the one in the back there you see. This one was from last year. It looks woody and tatty it's starting to absorb itself. So if that is what it's going to do during the rest of the season, fair enough. But these sheaths doesn't mean that the spike is dry and that's why it is still on here because I was living in hope. <laughs> didn't happen, didn't happen, but I would never ever cut these spikes off on these reed stem epidendrums simply because you never know if you're gonna get another bloom. And if it's not in the way, it doesn't do any harm. While we have this camera angle going, look at that second spike back there. That's a first for this orchid for me. Normally only ever one growth. But wait, there's more. There's another little quirk. Oh, hello, beautiful. <laughs> Ooh, total distraction. Let me show you another little quirk about these little reed stem epidendrums while I have a look. What are you? Nope, you're fine. Always be mindful of the mealybugs. Another little quirk down here is that a single growth can split up and divide and become two. As you can see at the bottom of the pot, this is one growing point that then mutated and created two growing points from a single eye. So the bigger of these hybrids is all in their mix of DNA and should not be underestimated. Now I'm not saying that they are space hogs as such, but the light training I find is super important to keep them upright and contained within their pots. Other than that, honestly, if airspace is not an issue because of their narrow growth habit, having them on the windowsill would be ideal. And my goodness, when these colors come out, isn't this just the most welcoming sight as we come out of somewhat darker days and cold days to be graced by these beautiful colors? I love them. And I'm glad that I have the hybrids to replace a René Marquez that just didn't grow well for me in my climate that I'm unable to even diagnose. But these three orchids are wonderful substitutes in my opinion. So I really, really appreciate that you came and watched my video, that you spent some time with me. This having been a very general approach to how I care for my hybrids. If you have any questions that were to be more specific, please ask away in the comments. I appreciate that and I shall be very happy to elaborate. Thank you so much for watching my video. I wish you a very beautiful day on one condition, please. 
And that is because I would love to see you in the next video, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.